Hello, and welcome to this new edition of the Fuji Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about OpenJDK 19. Welcome to the Fuji Podcast, all your news about OpenJDK. Since Java switched to a six-month release cycle in 2018, we've seen a steady flow of new versions with a fixed timeline. These new versions focus on stability and improvements that are reviewed, tested, and approved by the community. And this is a completely different approach compared to the Java releases before 2018, when there were several years between each release. And on the 20th of September, Java 19 is released. We're recording this podcast on the 19th, looking forward to the new features and changes that this release brings. Now, today, we're talking to some of the key people involved in the Java community. Hi, I'm Elsa Begner. So I am one of the members from JCP Executive Committee. So basically, aside of my work, I am reading all proposal that should be confirmed and agree that it goes to the new OpenJDK releases. On the other hand, I think uh, each uh, new JDK release brings a significant improvements, and I don't know, I don't have a measure, but I think it's always more than around 20% faster than the previous release. So it definitely makes sense to upgrade, even when you don't have the long time support version. So small pods just update the release to test it. And today we're going to touch some results of the project Amber Panama Loom. Let's see how it goes. Hi, um, I'm Mary Grigleski. So I'm a drug leader, Java users group leader um, in Chicago. Our community's got over 3,000 members. So I'm like representing this community of Java users. There are lots of actually Java installation in the Chicago area. Um, I myself too, I'm currently a developer advocate at Datastats and I've been working with Java since 2000. So quite early days, actually back then was doing some swing and it's kind of now it's all kind of all different. And so I've been, you know, doing all these work and uh, efficacy development, technical architecture. And, uh, you know, I can bring a lot of value in terms of bringing, you know, from more of the user's perspective as well. Um, and now I'm working on event streaming. So that's actually more all the more interested too to find out, you know, what Java can do, especially going forward, supporting some of these kind of very nifty technological advances, I guess, in more of the concurrency space. So. Hey everyone, uh, uh, I'm Deepu K. Shashidharan. Uh, I'm a Java champion and the co-lead of uh, Jacob's Tube. I work for uh, Okta as a developer advocate for Auth0. Yeah, I have been working uh, with Java for 13 years now, not coding lately, mostly just evangelizing lately as a developer advocate. But I'm quite excited uh, uh, to talk about uh, JDK 90, especially uh, since it has some of my uh, favorite uh, features that I'm looking forward to, like uh, virtual threads, the new um, foreign function interfaces and stuff like that. So quite excited to uh, discuss about these. And I'm Eric Koslo. I recently joined Azul as a senior director of product management, helping guide security capabilities into the primary JRE, um, the Azul JDK, to help people uh, develop and deploy more secure applications. All right. Now, the way that we usually get our podcast started is by covering a variety of articles that have been written in the Fuji community by different members who just cover news and what's going on in their realm of Java expertise. And we've had a couple uh, articles written recently that explain some of the features that are going on in JDK 19 um, and just the different features, what they are, who they're for, and how you can benefit. So I'd like to just walk through a couple of these. And Deepu, I know you were talking about one uh, before we started that just covers the concept of what is Project Loom and what are virtual threads and how do they make our applications faster? I wrote about uh, Project Loom. It was a project that I have been uh, you know, quite interested in for a while. So I have been following it uh, from the time it was announced, was going through all the name changes, concept changes and stuff. And I'm really excited for that. Uh, something that attracted me towards Go was uh, its uh, Go routines. So finally, I'm happy to see something closer uh, in, in the Java space. Uh, I'm pretty sure uh, the article will give you all the information about uh, what virtual threads are, what structured concurrency is, and what you can expect from it and stuff like that. So uh, please do go through the article in Fuji. I also wrote about uh, the foreign function interfaces in Fuji. So you can also go through that to get an idea of where we are uh, in terms of uh, you know, foreign functions in Java. 
All right. Um, so Miro, I know there's some other things that are going on in Java 19 other than just virtual threads. And you wrote an article about what can we expect in OpenJDK 19. So do you want to give a bit of a summary about uh, what you wrote in terms of other capabilities that are coming out? I need to first just sum it up what is coming actually in Java 19 as they are coming, not new features actually, but improvements one of the most significant improvement is in the project Loom, which is the virtual threads, which are continuing work. It's a third incubator. Um, there are some improvements. So there is the other feature, which I, don't, I wrote it in the article, but I don't remember to be fair, but it's a structural concurrency. Just a framework, how to simplify the running and joining multiple threads. It is quite of nice. It's, you can do the callbacks if uh, your scope crashes. So uh, it's really uh, simplifies the using of threading because in my daily job, I see a lot of codes as everyone others. I'm working as a principal in, in as a developer actually. And I see there's some kind of difficulties how to, how to approach the topics of concurrency and multi-threading. So other kind of features uh, which are not really as uh, for me, it's the project Amber. <laughs> Definitely continue work on the pattern matching and switch cases. I, I heard them many times, the kind of complaints that Java is too verbose and so on. But this project Amber has just really reduced the amount of code. And if you do use it properly, according to the creational design patterns or structural design patterns, your code will be very minimized. Together with the records and improvement performance on the records, sealed classes, and so on. So it definitely makes a sense to take a look on Java and, and migrate from this perspective. Other features that already been, been available on 18, just a, I think it was in 15 past, right? The text blocks and so on. I don't know what's other opinion, but for me, I, I really like it. And I'm looking for the next release. Awesome. Um, and I know the other article that you were alluding to was about um, thinking how through how to do massive throughputs with virtual threads. Um, mm -hmm. And Mary, would you like to talk about that a little bit? So essentially, too, I think the whole goal is to increase throughput. And uh, in order to do that, right, because your platform, your operating systems are all limited, you, you can only do so much. So you try to increase the throughput by using virtual threads that are managed by the JDK. In that case too, I look at it more like, okay, we're using JDK sort of as the middleman, so to speak, and kind of give you the illusion of being able to kind of increase your, your memory, which actually you have limited, um, but it kind of gives you the illusion that you can actually do that and then have JDK manage the virtual threads in that sense. So. So it is exciting, I think, in some ways too, but also um, anytime you leverage on another middleman, so to speak, to kind of manage this kind of layer is going to also, at the same time, right? You, you're benefiting from virtualizing all your threats, but it can also make you know the management side uh, tricky as well. So it's, it's probably theoretically, it's great, but when we come to actually using it, there are lots of these tiny little things you need to be managing and all of these. So it's a good thing. So, and uh, there, there's there's a lot of promising things in there, but still being worked on at this point. So we'll be, we're waiting to see how effective and how good it is. And is it going to be buggy uh, handling all of these little inner workings that needs to happen, so. All right, now to just have a couple conversations about this, I know um, not all of these features are being released in JDK 19 at the same level of availability, because one of the things that they have is the concept of preview features. I think um, some of the features like Loom in particular, you have to enable a flag to indicate that you want to use this preview. Let's just talk about what capabilities you need between a development environment where you're willing to, to tinker with preview features and how it relates to production environments or situations where you need that robust viability. In this specific release, if you compare it with the previous ones, uh, I think except for the Linux uh, RISD port, everything is either preview or incubator feature. So I consider preview features to be a bit more production ready than incubator because of the specific reason that there is no documentation, proper documentation around the incubators or it is extremely outdated. 
for example, like the if you look at documentation for the foreign function memory API, it's like documentation probably wasn't updated after JDK 14 or something. So it's if someone tries those examples, they are not going to work and stuff. Whereas for uh, uh, the preview ones, it's slightly better at least. But using them in production, I personally don't recommend anyone to use these in production because for the fact that the APIs might change, things might break, break especially for the foreign function memory API because it has a large uh, API footprint. So using that in production would be a lot of uh, effort to do in the first place. And then for with each version, if you have to migrate and like, you know, work on that, then probably not. But for Project Loom, um, at least for virtual threads, the, the API surface is quite smaller. So you can actually afford to use that in uh, production if you really want to and still get away with, uh, you know, not having to change a lot because you can actually get away with using that in preview if someone really wants to. And uh, looking at the performance of uh, threads and, and we know it is going to work, right? Because uh, Golang uh, uh, proved how uh, efficient user mode threads are. And that is one of the reasons Go became such a, uh, uh, such widely adopted, not just because it is simple, right? It, it had extremely good uh, user mode threads. And uh, even at the initial numbers, looking at the initial numbers and performance, Project Loom seems to be like, the virtual thread seems to be like far ahead in terms of performance uh, uh, when compared to platform threads. And the fact that you don't have to resort to complex architectures like uh, Reactive or, or even uh, asynchronous programming to uh, get better throughput, might be good enough reason for someone to consider using it in uh, production, but having to use the preview flags and stuff is still a little bit uh, a barricade, I would say, for everyone. But yeah, that, that's my opinion. So I think one of the benefits that the preview flags did is that was one of the ways that they were able to dramatically decrease the release cycle, whereas it used to be multiple years. And you have yeah. to get feedback as you build something, like especially when you go to have virtual threads, you can have difficulties. Anytime a new complex feature hits the real world, you have all kinds of feedback that come, comes back to you, not just on the tech side, but also on the usability slot side. So I think by having a flag that says enable preview because I want to try this, it really expands the opportunity of people to experiment with them with virtual threads with the foreign function interface um, versus those who have to specifically go out there and download a new JRE with these capabilities in place. Yeah. Um, also, it probably makes the JDK a little more fun to work on because you can build features and get feedback on them and have things uh, iterate and just work well with something that's continually shipping versus working on something that starts falling behind and then having to catch up and then having to finally release. So it seems like it's easier to work on and gets more feedback from people. We've been broke the article like about the virtual threads. So we saw in incubation first, second, the, the executors when the actual, actual implementation has been running, has been shifted. So there have been drastic improvements. So I know back to time when I work on Robo4j framework, which is the, for small uh, devices and better system, right? We implement with, with there was a platform press, there was still the Java 8, then the Nava 10, and we just, really been able to make a significant fast throughput to passing just a task, just a runnable task on the, on the executors and control the executors. This is basically what is happening, but virtual threads are way better because they can postpone the threads. They are passed on the executors, but the virtual thread there's implemented logic to postpone the execution of the task. So if this is the why, then can be pretty, 30 millions or maybe more threads created because it's actually postponed the execution by the platform and the platform threads are not stuck. So this is very cool feature. And I may, I may think it will be contributing to high throughput, but in special area of task. I wouldn't recommend to use the task in very hard processing operation like involving IO requesting other tasks where can delay can be task and the threads can be like uh, stopped <laughs> or run in the cycle. Yeah, that needs to be careful. So it needs to be considered in the design, but it's a very powerful feature, extremely. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the difference is vast. Like uh, when I was uh, yeah. running 
uh, virtual threads was normal. I was able to get 32,000 of platform <laughs> threads, of course, because of garbage yeah. collection and like 14 million of these, <laughs> even with yeah. garbage collection. Like, so that yes. was like, wow. <laughs> because it has the logic, it has yeah. the mark and it just postponed the execution of the task on the instruction level. And this yeah. is amazing. Like, yeah, that's a very cool, cool feature. This is different, right? When you have the part platform threads, when you initiate the executors, but actually, this, it should have a reason why you initiate the executors or why you having a thread running, right? There needs to be a reason to do this because platform threads are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You should be always careful about this. Actually, to debugging it, it's probably better to run <laughs> the platform threads because I tried to do the fly recording with uh, virtual threads in the release, I think 18. And yeah, it, Someone needs to already know what is going on there in order to get it right. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's but, but it's a preview, right? So yes, and uh, yeah, and then you are right. The, actually, there is a, in Java 19. There is a they it add the builder there in the thread builder that you can create a builder that you don't have to have a factory in order mm -hmm. to create the names. But it may this this kind of cool feature. I say great may <laughs> make the all code unstable if someone extended the thread class and make a builder for himself. So, oh, come on, it can be incompatible yeah. then. But there are such as caveats, but I think it's worthwhile to refactor the code. Yeah, also, I think given that these days, especially like a majority of use cases for Java, like especially like web apps and stuff like that, people using threads directly probably would be like a minority, I would say. Most people would be using some sort of frameworks. Yeah. And, and in that case, I think the, the benefit could, would you know, go to the end user quite fast yeah. because pretty sure most frameworks are just going to migrate to which other. I mean, why wouldn't I? I mean, if I'm if I'm having a framework, why wouldn't I migrate to that, right? Uh, unless I am doing some niche where I really need platform threats and control and stuff, yes. then maybe. But for everything else, why wouldn't they use? I, I, I have to keep going back to Go for this because that's yep. a success story we all have. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and Go proved that you actually don't need platform threats. You, you can get away with just having uh, uh, coroutines, right? So yes. yeah, it, it, we have a case study that, that proves that. So why wouldn't you migrate to this? So. But I say maybe someone other has a different opinion. I see the Java is very powerful tool actually is a very nice API. It gives you the feeling that you can work with the memory like you want, but it is not true, right? <laughs> <laughs> you cannot do deeper. And we saw many times some different kind of composition of the code according to concurrency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean it's very nice to observe that Java works hard on giving the user kind of way how they should think about the concurrency. Yeah. And how to should and in, in order for my way, it's more each release. Yeah, it doesn't matter if it's LTS. It's getting more that you don't need many other frameworks. It started with the text blocks. It started with the switch expressions. You know, there you don't need the Guava and so on anymore. Mm -hmm. Such mm -hmm. kind of and uh, local variable types and so on. So you you really can do really nice code with with the Java. In my yeah, way, we are definitely getting there. <laughs> yes, and I, I'm happy to see it. So my heart is beating Java. Although I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still a polyglot uh, developer, no. No, so I, I, I still work with uh, other languages. And to be honest, these three aspects, like uh, you know, uh, the concurrency part, the foreign functions, and uh, pattern yeah. matching, this has always been uh, something that used to annoy me in Java. <laughs> Because I was using, I was using like JavaScript, Go, Rust, and everything, and they all have like pattern matching. Yeah, man, great pattern matching yes. uh, features. Like uh, FFA is much more simpler to do, much more stable uh, to use, and and uh, threading is much more uh, easier to manage. <laughs> we all know. I mean, Java is powerful when it comes to threading, but using it properly is a different story, right? Yes. With all the and the way that uh, uh, we do it with the synchronizations and also, it's not the most intuitive way to work no. with them especially for beginners and like you know so I'm, I'm quite happy we are going in this direction and we are making it simpler i'm actually quite excited for the structural concurrency uh, feature because it is definitely going to make uh you know the those use cases much less brittle uh yeah. where you don't have to uh, you know write all that logic to handle all this thing yourself because I, I remember writing logics to handle these things in some like during my consultancy days when i was uh, you know building application for people <laughs> i remember having to uh specifically write so much so much logic to uh make sure okay if there 
is a thread blocking okay you know uh, roll back the previous things and like all these things Those, they, that was so annoying. So I'm like, if if we had this, it would have been much more easier to write those kind of logics where you have, you know, like like multiple uh, uh, parallelism uh, going on. Yeah. So yeah, I'm quite excited for this. Yes, I think the this structured concurrency offers a nice way how to create a callback back to the Java. The same, it's very nice. Yes, I agree with you. Like concurrency itself is a different topic <laughs> than just using if else uh, a construct. I, I, I do want to mention that heart, my heart is beating for Java. It's, I'm also using uh, many, many other languages uh, uh, like last time the Kotlin, but I, but I observe Kotlin, Scala and so on. And on the big, bigger project is they are those languages nice. They, they may have some kind of really nice features that how can you structure the particular code on the one line and very short. But if you implementing the, the design patterns, which you theoretically want to have because you would love to maintain your code, right? It turns into that they have also the problems. So in order to solve that, for example, the callback to stop it and Scala, so you need to do some stuff. And it's the same with the Kotlin. It's also, it's amazing language. It's great. It's really, I love some features there. Yeah, actually the Sun Java is now going to closer, <laughs> but anyhow, it provides you nice features. In long-term run, if I, if I take a look on the complete application, I would probably migrate it into Java, make some many things easier and more type safety. And I've, I know that at the, at the end, the com, JIT compiler will dynamically compile the instructions. Yeah. But anyhow, I think that there are for those languages, a lot of additional instructions to, to be created. So the Java will be still the performance, although it will be optimized. <laughs> As you see, like the JVM is very powerful too. It will be from long run, it will be optimized. So I just like to kind of supplement a little bit because you brought up to the fact that, you know, now, I mean, with JVM, the thing, the nice thing about it is that, yeah, most users are not going to be worrying about that layer of coding. But let's say here in Chicago, we have a lot of trading companies like Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Board Options Exchange, all of these. They, in fact, because they realize the frameworks um, tend to be slower than if you can write things natively. So they actually take upon themselves and and uh, at least I'm aware of mercantile exchange, right? They're doing their own trading uh, algorithms, all of these things. So I think they are going to be happy to hear about, you know, having like virtual threats. They can actually implement and really increase all their throughput. And then with all of the electronic trading, they are really handling huge volumes of data. So I think they're going to be very excited about it. So some of my members are kind of quite excited already. Yeah, that, that that's that's definitely true. And I think it is even more true for structured concurrency because I don't think that will be handled a lot in framework level so that probably will land in user space where they are doing parallel stuff so i think that would be a lot more impact for users like in terms of migrations and stuff so i think we have been talking a lot about project loom so maybe <laughs> we should also uh, talk a little bit about the other uh, uh, cool features uh, yeah. <laughs> well cool feature there is a project panama right yeah i'm personally excited about how how it goes through maybe we don't talk, talk about it because this is kind of specific and you need to be very into the Java details. Of what yeah, is yeah. happening with the with the heap memory? Yeah, yeah let's go heap. into the details. Like you know, <laughs> I I hate JNI. I hate JNI because I'm a huge fan of memory safety and stuff. I I hate C C plus plus. You know, like uh, I consider them the plague of uh, software yeah. industry at this like with, with all the security vulnerabilities coming. That's one reason I really like Rust because you know it, it kind of <laughs> forces you to rethink and you know stuff like that. So I. Like the first time I actually started learning about JNI uh, was like, uh, yeah. I think uh, back, again, back back in my consulting days, uh, uh, we had to integrate this uh, really legacy PDF writer into a Java application. And like, so we had to use JNI for that. And it was horrible. It was a horrible experience. I wrote about that in the in the Fuji thing and on, on my website about explaining how, uh, how ridiculous JNI is. The fact that I cannot even 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 if I forget all the user experience aspect of JNA, which is mm -hmm. horrible, <laughs> uh, the memory safety aspect is just horrible. I mean, why would you take a memory safe language, uh, a relatively memory safe language, and add uh, something there where you expose the entire JVM memory as a, a pointer to you a C, C? Sorry, <laughs> you mean unsafe? 
<laughs> yeah, 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 like why would you expose that JNAN, right? Like that's that's yeah. technically the JVM memory, and you are passing that as a pointer to C code. Why would you do that? So you're throwing away safety of Java, and so why not just write everything in C plus plus C C then, right? So I, I I hated that I used to tell people never use JNA, uh, you know, unless <laughs> it is the last thing that you have to do, or unless yeah, someone yeah. has a, a you know gun to your head. Uh, so I'm I'm quite happy that. Finally, we have something to throw away, Jay, and I forget that you, that ever happened or existed and like move, move away. Yeah, you, you know, but the goal of, of the project is to implement the API above. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not just Jay <laughs> and I will be still there, but, yeah, uh, but probably but... no one will be used and they will be really yeah, happy. Yeah. Actually, yeah, it's really nice that you have a that you have the way and the decision to access the off heap memory where can other competitor like other competitive languages play. Like it can be C, it can be COBOL, <laughs> it can be whatever, but you have access. Kinds of night transparent API, how you can access the memory and how you can read it. I, I would say that it's easy to, to understand, to get the memory layouts, to get it right. You need to know what is happening with your language in order to have addresses, yeah. But it gives you this, the safety that what you read is gonna be what you expected. And this is very big difference. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it will be very faster when you have, you know, what what you need to do. So it will be nice. Okay, you you haven't done this. Okay, go away. Yeah. Don't <laughs> so there you are reading too much or you are reading too less. So go away. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I am really curious where it's going to, how how far they go, and maybe better in the next release or next LTS. Yeah release it will be ready to to use hopefully it's uh, still in incubator right i think yeah. uh, i think it's the first one yeah it's preview now okay vector is incubator yeah so hopefully yeah. hopefully are, not two more previews <laughs> yes exactly but they are already iterative so there are yeah. already iterations so they are not the first ones and the foreign definitely is like a third i mean I, i'm guessing there might be two more previews so hopefully by uh, JDK 21, it could be stabilized if yeah. there are for, no further more changes. So we, we might have that uh, maybe both uh, virtual threads and uh, the foreign functional memory API could be stabilized by 21. So, okay, it's still it's still a bit far far away, but not, not bad. <laughs> I'm excited about this uh, because maybe it's come out that when this is ready, so other, other support of other languages comes up uh, to the JVM. Uh, yeah, but uh, it's C, C and drop, right? So I yeah. think uh, we can already use, I mean, I already tried out with Rust. So I think yeah. anything that is C and drop should 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 be fair game. So I think that, <laughs> I think, I, I wouldn't personally ask for more than that. Uh, C and drop is good no. enough, I would say. And you can work with any other uh, C and drop languages. And I think that's what most of the languages provide anyway. So I think that, that uh, for me, that, that would be good enough. And J extract makes things much more easier. So I really appreciate uh, uh, you know, uh, that when this feature was built, it was not just the feature, but the tool was also made that it will make it easier yes. to you know, uh, work with large uh, header files and stuff, because otherwise you'd have to still uh, hand code all that and it's a lot of boilerplate, right? So that's yeah. it's quite nice that uh, you know, there is J extract, which makes things easier. Yeah, yeah, so maintaining those header files is always extremely difficult for anyone who does JNI. So can you talk a little bit more about what J extract is and how somebody would use that if they're a, a C developer, a Python developer, a Rust developer to get interact interoperability between Java and their language of choice? I think it will again be like, uh, so we'll be working in terms of C headers, right? So for example, if, I'm, if I want to uh, run my Rust uh, application in, 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 uh, with, with uh, you know, the foreign functional memory API, then I would uh, generate uh, C headers. The Rust supports generating C, C headers. So I'll generate C headers and then I, uh, I'll be using J extract uh, I'll be I'll run J extract against that C header, which generates my uh, Java skeleton for that, and then I'll, you know, yeah, basically import that and use it in my Java application. So that 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 part becomes easier. But I think what J extract might not do is 
when you have a lot of memory manipulations happening uh, in your use case, then you might have to you know, uh, work further, uh, use the API directly to do that. But again, it, it is still uh, uh, reducing at least half the boilerplate that you would otherwise have to do, especially on large headers, because in real world use cases, I would say you're not going to work with one or two methods from the, you know, the other language application, whatever, right? You might be using multiple, a lot of methods and uh, uh, running J extract seems like the, the best way to start. Then you, further modify based on what your particular use case is. So it is a great start, I would say. All right, so moving out beyond features a little bit, there's a couple different Java versions that are pretty prominent in the industry now. In terms of long-term support releases, you have Java 8, you have Java 11, you have Java 17. And I think the next long-term support release is um, going to be 2020 or 21, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so Mary, you have a jug with quite a few different people in it. How are your members handling which version of Java they choose? Actually, interestingly, to be honest with you, there are still folks using Java 8. And, and I think mainly too, is like their companies that they are with from talking with them, they're just management. They feel it's risky every time if you just even do a minor release upgrade and they, because to them, their production systems are of, you know, utmost importance, cannot go down all these things. And so members do tend to come and join the jugs. They are more progressively minded. So I see they're kind of a, a bit of a frustration, I think, dealing with trying to convince their management to try to upgrade. And at the same time, also kind of reassuring that, okay, the upgrade isn't going to cause big headaches. And that's what companies is worrying about. But certainly too, in terms of like members, they are are all excited they're always ready for new features especially when they're you know kind of like working with some things for a long time and they realize they wanted to do more if their feature you know the, the the current version isn't able to meet their needs and they have to write their own you know additional code to handle some things that otherwise you can get it in a new version of a jdk for example so yeah so that's the the situation that i'm seeing right now in terms of their readiness to adopt so Okay, so there is a pretty high concentration on people using Java 8, the version, like there have been Java 8 patches since um, then, but Java 8 was first released in, I think, 2014. I think I'd say not all are using Java 8, but I was surprised to find that quite a few are still using Java 8. I didn't, haven't done like a, you know, actual statistics kind of asking how many are using 8 and how many 11, but certainly to their increasing number using 11 as well. I'd say probably majority of people are using 11. But um, still, some are still on eight, and a few actually already upgraded to seventeen. But it's kind of fewer than you know the actual that we'd like to see. So, okay, so that's eight and eleven with a number of people moving to seventeen. So, how about people on the medium term or short term support releases that are in between those, like a, a Java thirteen, a Java fourteen? Um, Miro, do you have any insight into um, people who are using those? I, I need honestly say I don't have any insight. That using, but I know the companies, uh, they are actually migrating their microservices according to uh, six, uh, six months release uh, model. And of course, uh, the core features are standing on the long term support, but uh, there are some, some features, that, uh, some pods that can be deployed, some small containers that actually it doesn't matter which kind of version it runs. And this kind of uh, in middle release midterm release, they can be used for testing and statistics and so on to see and testing new feature. I actually adopt new feature into the team, uh, which I make a sense. So I see very, very few only on, in big companies, like, for example, <laughs> like in size of Azul <laughs> or, <laughs> or Echo or Red Hat and so on. I think they are testing and running some stuff. So we've talked a lot about Project Loom, Amber, and upgrading between different JDKs. Um, but what are some what are a feature that each of you really likes and are kind of personally excited for? Personally, uh, it's it's definitely uh, virtual threads that I'm uh, most excited for, followed by uh, uh, Project Panama, maybe. But one thing that probably you know uh, underrated or what I see as a great direction for Java is record patterns. Uh, it's great that we, uh, you know, started uh, incrementally adding support for pattern matching, like uh, the the uh, pattern matching for switch and all that stuff. And I think record patterns opens up uh, a, a new, you know, uh, arena to 
make pattern matching complete because whatever pattern matching we have in java is still not complete if you compare it to any other modern language it's still not complete you can't do a lot of fancy stuff there with record patterns i'm, I'm hoping that we are moving to the direction of being able to pattern match classes for example that uh, i'm hoping that would be the next uh, iteration i saw some discussions about at, at, at the class level to kind of define how uh, something will be destructured i mean destructuring is a great for developers experience i would say uh, and and i think uh, i hope this is the first step in uh, java having powerful destructuring capabilities like uh, you know uh, uh, other modern languages uh, where uh, you know developers can write all these like like in scala or kotlin or, or rust you know you can write is all these beautiful destructured uh, assignments and you can you can reduce your huge if else spaghetti to like few lines of this beautiful code so i think developers will be uh, excited i mean it's not going to add like value in terms of being fast or whatever, but developer productivity is going to be better. I would say developers are going to be much, much more happier uh, writing those. Uh, so I think it's an underappreciated feature and it's nice that we are opening up that door and you know going, going there. I found it also the record classes quite of useful in, in order to DTO file, especially when the behind the scene generates for you the two string hash code and equals which <laughs> if you have a team for 20 people, then the, the, the kind of experience is distributed. <laughs> so it's very nice that you have a, a records doing that all that for you. It's easy to review such kind of codes and to maintain because maintainability, you, you talk about the developer productivity. Okay, <laughs> so that's nice, uh, but maintainability is also the right part of productivity. Because if they produce one line code or something which is completely unmaintainable, that is not productive. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so then I, I really see that this 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 kind of jump would be observed on the each, even new releases. Each new releases is getting here in Java, and in order. And I heard from Mary about the kind of manager aspects that they are avoid to migrate to the new releases and so on that they have a struggle uh, with this. I, I'm just asking if everyone is running the AVS or any other cloud provider, whatever, and building the very big images and paying for so many instructions of being run there. And if they think, okay, let's save this money <laughs> with smaller images <laughs> and invest there this money into the refactoring and make code stable. It, I think it may be untestable, in many cases testable, because the new features, especially this pattern matching at Project Amber, it gives you the way how even unexperienced guys can test code, uh, even with, uh, with Panama, with the structure concurrency. It will be testable, and this is the key. Like, And I think it's worthwhile to put those money you spend in investing, creating super big I, I saw four gigabytes big images which doing nothing <laughs> and paying for them in order to create a few hundred megabytes image with the new release. I mean, it's a trade, right? Anyone needs to decide. Well, what do you want to pay? Your team or just AVS or any cloud provider? Also, I think it's it's also quite important for the language to keep up, right? I mean, there's yeah. so much uh, uh, newer languages, the uh, the competition, and 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 especially newer generations of uh, developers. They also, I see that a lot lot of people also uh, care about the the convenience the language offers, how cool it is, and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think these kind of features, I mean, we can't keep justifying not having this for a long time. So I think you have to catch up at some point and 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 provide those fancy cool features but you are working for a hipster right the chain hipster. <laughs> yeah 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 so, no so but, the, but it, it, it's true you know like uh, uh i like those like it feels nicer when you have like when i'm writing rust code it feels nice that i can do that complex destructuring it uh, sometimes it's like a challenge okay how how much can i push this in terms of destructuring how can i uh, i know it's not like probably not the most readable uh, sometimes but sometimes you know it's like okay how much can i uh, can i do this in one line with hey, with the crazy yes. destructuring instead of like four or five ifs can i do that yes i can so yeah okay so i yeah. think you know, there are people like that <laughs> no i definitely agree with you i definitely agree i do remember back on the time like a couple of years yet live and writing the code in cobol 
So <laughs> I had to maintain, oh, well, Cobol, you have zero testability, so you need to really follow stuff. Yeah. And I know then you work with memory and I found the copybooks extremely cool feature, which is maybe uh, our uh, foreign memory access is getting there. Yeah. Then you can really transfer whatever sequence of bytes to whatever you want. But in Cobol, you cannot just verify it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyhow, I do, I do agree. I definitely do agree. Agree. People love to work with the uh, new. Some some young people generation are more excited, not about using the proper design patterns, but about using the features. Which is, <laughs> hey, developers <laughs> also need to have fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but if you if you just review, okay, how many instructions you have? Come on. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so sometimes it's too much fun. It's too dangerous. <laughs> Especially when you are responsible for the project. If not, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and and I actually I do agree. I mean, sometimes to kind of make things more nifty, so to speak, is the way to sustain your language as well. Because as such, Deepu is bringing up their competitions too. There are other ways of doing things, but we need to get keep up with it and then retain that level of interest or if not increase. And especially young people, I think they will love kind of this kind of nifty features yeah in order to kind of keep keep us kind of sustain the whole ecosystem yeah. <laughs> so, totally. you, you you hook them with these features then they stay yeah. for the jvm exactly <laughs> yeah I like yeah that. yeah the, the young developers they don't care about the heap stack method stack well why <laughs> why actually, should they right <laughs> yeah i should actually share with you too because even with my chicago java users group i'm seeing a bit of a decrease in interest and in people coming and i i just recently did a survey and then was trying to see what people like to uh, see right if we have speakers coming amazingly a lot of them actually wants language features um that that's something i should be sharing with the community larger in large too because i was asking do you want like system level stuff do you want like you know frameworks and all that and actually there was one guy that commented or guy or gal commented that well sometimes we don't really care so much about the other things we want to know how the language can be made better and we want to learn more about the language. I don't want to disclose where this happened, but I have been in discussions where the choice of programming language was like, uh, 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 you know, like by say, say if there was a voting, majority chose based on how cool the language and how how much <laughs> features it has, rather than like the other, the other is like, yeah, okay. I mean, but how much fun needs to work with this? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's an important aspect. It's an overlooked aspect, but it's quite important that you know, when you're working with something, you also need to have a little bit of fun. If it is not fun at all, if it is only about the performance and stuff, then, you know, you kind of, you don't have that interest. But anyhow, I would love to comment, just jump in. Hey, if you have a really not nicely, unfriendly written the code base, it doesn't matter the language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they, they say, that's the legacy. Yeah. yeah that's the legacy. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay, that's the legacy, man. Just don't touch it. Yeah, and that's very, that's what the, very <laughs> unfriendly. Doesn't yeah. matter. And I had this kind of stuff in Scala. I had also this kind of stuff in Kotlin. And it does not make, it doesn't really make it fun. I hate, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I hate Scala. I hate Scala. It's 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 too complex. Uh, 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 it's it's the other extreme of having fancy features. Like uh, there's too many guns that you can shoot uh, your own foot with. So well, you need to have a discipline, right? It, otherwise, the gun is shooting. <laughs> and if you have, if, yeah, if you work with number of people, not alone in a project, and that <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's I, I really work with some Scala code bases and. <laughs> Uh, I, I I was like not happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> this can be funny, yeah, yeah, because they. I think it's very. I, I personally think as for data analysis, it's amazing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, with all the overhead it generates, yeah, yeah, yeah. just forget it for data analysis is my. But you need to have a kind of uh, my experience. You need to have a kind of same level of knowledge and awareness. People there, otherwise it's very complicated. Yeah, hey, it still doesn't help when everything is implicit. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, but it's nice what Mary said that the people are more taking care about the the platform itself. Mm -hmm. Like yes. what I what I'm missing is we work too hard on to introduce the models. Yeah. Uh, and uh, 
modular product Jig Jigsaw, which gives you kind of really security on the platform, the class level, and it allows you to reduce. We, we get the seal classes, which reduce you to inheritance, right? And as I see the seal classes, oh yeah, I use it in project, yeah, for, but we have a plan on how to use this. Yeah, so there is an architecture diagram that even newcomers need to, do, need to see it, but they are used right now kind of nicely in the JDK itself, and they are doing very, very nice jobs, sealed classes. But I may think that they are not that fancy <laughs> because they need to use, be used for purpose. It's a very powerful yeah. feature, but uh, this is what I think that uh, young generation or newcomers are missing. Just people are not able to give the enough purpose. Okay, that's the cool feature. Although it is, it's it's the one of the guns, but <laughs> other from the Stella way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you the security and the module I haven't seen actually, to be honest, like very few projects that have been using the modules, <laughs> Java platform modules. Yeah, yeah true. that's I sad. I've seen that a lot as well. Yeah, no one wants to refactor all the frameworks. <laughs> <laughs> although, although wasn't it in Java 19 is coming to improvement the reflection APIs? So, yeah. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but at least it is helping with this um, incubator preview kind of things, right? Uh, with the modules. So. Right. Uh, modularity was introduced to make the JDK easier to work on, not necessarily yeah. for um, the downstream projects or the people who yeah. need to use it. I think it's serving its purpose already with this iterative previews and like incubators. So. But it's a nice way to modules, you know, to have the legacy code. Okay, let's create a module, let's name module. Here is the legacy and let's build above. That can be a very powerful feature in order to refactor, to get the rid of the a nice code, which makes everyone unhappy in the team. All right, so that's a lot of really good information. So I just want to say thank you very much, uh, first of all, to all the guests of the episode, and thank you for listening. And please keep an eye on Fuji for future articles about development and everything related to the Open JDK world. Thanks, and have a great day. Give me a Fuji. Give me a J, give me the friends of OpenJDK.